You see, I know why you're attending a conference like this. I know why you would be drawn to the book I wrote. It's because you were hoping somewhat beyond hope to bring joy into your own workplace. Deep down, you know that there is a better way to run a business, a team, a company, a department. You've always known it. Those thoughts come to you just before falling asleep or just after waking. And then your day begins. And the idea of transformational change evaporates like a maddening dream you can't seem to reassemble after waking from it. Although you may be silently, or perhaps not so silently, tortured by that monster boss in your own current broken company culture, you haven't given up completely. Change is still possible. I was in the same place once, deeply unsatisfied with my work and my own ability to do anything about it. But things can be better. And that's what I'm going to walk through in my talk with you today. So great to be here. It's my first time to India. You guys have already taken great care of me. Can you get the slides up on the screen now? Uh-oh, that doesn't look promising. <laughs> Figure a guy who runs a software company is probably going to have technical difficulties. Let's try replugging it in here. See if that helps. Voila. Excellent. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to give you a peek inside of my company. And I think the best way to do that is with a video. The video is a trailer for the book. It's not the point of me showing you this. It's really to just give you a 90 second view into what I'm about to describe. disillusionment, and by 1997, when I was promoted to vice president of product development, I wanted out. I wanted to get as far away from this industry as I could, and then in that moment, I decided to change the industry, and that's the story that I've captured in this book. People are coming from all over the planet to come visit this space that's in the basement of a parking structure in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they're coming for a reason. They're coming to see something. What most people are looking for is some lessons around what it takes to build an intentionally joyful culture. Imagine half of my team had joy and the other half didn't. Which half would you want working on your project? We had so many requests for these tours, we realized it was time to share this story with the world in a different way. And that's how the book came to be. The space is flexible. We work two to a computer. We assign these pairs. We switch them every five working days. The human energy that results from this kind of organization, you can actually feel the joy when you're in the room. My name is Richard Sheridan, and I'm the author of Joy, Inc. Thank you. So I want to just give you a little bit of peek into my personal history, because I think if you don't understand where I've come from, the rest of what I describe I don't think makes particular sense. Uh-oh. There we go. <laughs> so I started out in this industry when I was just a little kid. I wrote my first program in 1971. It was a two-line program in BASIC, typed into a teletype. Yes, kids, there were, in fact, computers back in 1971, as hard as that is to imagine. And I was hooked. Right from the beginning, I realized that I want to be in this industry. I thought software was going to be one of the coolest professions ever. By 1973, I had created a game that would now be termed fantasy baseball. But I just wanted to play baseball on the computer. So I typed all the major league players in, uh, in the major leagues into the computer so my friends and I could play games of baseball against each other in the winter months where I grow up, you can't play baseball in the winter. There's too much snow on the ground. And that won an international programming contest. And quite frankly, my career was started at that point because I got a first 
my first job as a programmer before I could drive in 1973. I eventually got a couple of degrees from the University of Michigan in computer science and computer engineering, and I will tell you, in this period of my life, I was experiencing absolute joy in my profession. I thought, boy, this is going to be the coolest career ever. And quite frankly, the career that followed was a wonderful upward trajectory from programmer at one end in 1982 to vice president of R&D by 1997. Everything the world would measure as success, I had. Title, position, authority, team size, responsibility, pay, stock options, I had it all. There was only one significant problem. There was a different line in my life. Not the line the world measures as success, but the line measured in here. You see, I began to fall out of love with what I did as a profession. I didn't want to be in the industry anymore. What was going on at this time for me? Well, shortly after graduating from the University of Michigan, I, I got into this profession, and suddenly I realized that a lot of what I was experiencing was chaos. Chaos in the software industry is easy to imagine. Most of you have probably experienced it. Bug reports coming out of our ears, missed deadlines, blown budgets, feeling like we're coming to work in firefighting costumes every day. I would come home after work, long days, my wife would look at my tired eyes, the cold dinner in the microwave, and she'd say, honey, you look really tired. Did you get a lot done today? And I'd say, no, I got nothing done today. And the trouble of operating in chaos <clears throat> is eventually chaos produces negative events. You end up, and you can have big negative events in the software industry. The one I talk about in my book is where a tired programmer in New York City mistakenly updated some server software, and in the next 45 minutes, Knight Capital Group's trading platform traded $7 billion worth of securities it wasn't supposed to, costing Knight Capital Group $400 million in 45 minutes. Are you with me? That would be considered a negative event where you work, losing $400 million in 45 minutes. You know, there's an old saying that says to err is human, to really foul things up requires a computer. And I think that's good evidence of it. I was experiencing negative events, nothing quite as serious as losing $400 million in 45 minutes. But I'll tell you, when your organization experiences negative events, when something goes wrong, there is an organizational response. And my company was no different. It usually shows up in the form of a three-ring binder with no value-added documents whatsoever. You know, in our industry, we call it a software development life cycle. There's a bunch of templated documents with stage gates and committees and sign-offs and approvals and standing meetings and that sort of thing. You actually have to put a police force in charge of it, a project management office. And now you go from chaos to full-blown bureaucracy. You go from the land of never getting anything done to the land of never getting anything started. Because you're waiting. You're waiting for an approval to happen. You're waiting for a sign-off. You're waiting for a meeting to occur, a decision to be made, and so on. That was my life. And the trouble is, even in the bureaucratic world where you're trying to prevent mistakes, stuff still needs to happen. So little shadow IT groups were forming. So you could work around the system to actually get things done. And now I was operating in the worst possible world, the world of chaos and bureaucracy simultaneously. This is why my heart was breaking early in my profession. I was only in my 30s at that point, and I couldn't look out ahead and say, I can stay in this business for another 30 years. I just don't think I could do it. I don't think I had the mental energy. <clears throat> now, usually what happens in this case is, eventually the company wakes up and says, hey, let's, 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 let's back this bureaucracy off just a little bit. Let's, let's create a lighter version of our processes and procedures. Uh, a little stapled together document for short projects. And usually even those meetings don't happen. Uh, we eventually get rid of the process and we fire the PMO and then we say we're agile now. Or we're lean. And usually all that means really is we're just choosing chaos again. Just going back and forth and back and forth between chaos and bureaucracy. This was my life for a decade. So what did I do? 
I was thinking of getting out of the industry. I didn't want to be here anymore. But the trouble was, this is what was paying for my lifestyle. I was married, three children, house, two cars. The only way I could afford this lifestyle was to stay in this job I was beginning to hate. Now, I am an eternal optimist. If you put me in a room full of manure, I will keep digging till I find the pony. And so, my journey out led me to authors and books, but not books on technology, because quite frankly, technology is easy compared to organizing human teams effectively. So the books I was seeking out were books like Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, on the art and practice of building a learning organization, Tom Peter's book, In Search of Excellence, Peter Drucker's books on management, John Naismith's book, Megatrends. All these books were pointing a way to a bright future. They just didn't tell you how to get there. But I was determined to find it. I knew I would know it when I saw it. And quite frankly, in 1999, two years after I became VP, I had a click moment. <clears throat> I read a book by Kent Beck called Extreme Programming Explained. I saw a video on an industrial design firm in California called IDEO, and suddenly the future was clear for me. I knew where I was going. I knew how I was going to get there. And for the next two years, I transformed a tired old company, a tired old public company, to look much like what Menlo looks like today. And in 2001, maybe you remember 2001, this thing called the internet bubble burst, and suddenly hundreds of thousands of people like me were out of work. I had laid off my entire team, and then the California company that had purchased my company said, Rich, we don't need a VP anymore for a team of zero, so you lost your job too. I went home and told my wife I, I, was, on, I was out of work, and she looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she said, you're unemployed? I said, no, honey, I'm an entrepreneur now. <laughs> Remember, eternal optimist. <clears throat> It took her six months to figure out that entrepreneurship actually pays less than unemployment in the United States. <laughs> but then we were profitable. Because you see, in 2001, when I lost my job, they could take everything away from me but one thing. Yes, I lost my title, I lost my authority, I lost my team, my paycheck, my stock options, everything taken away from me but one thing. They could not take away from me what I had learned in those two years. I hear voices. <laughs> I realized there was an antidote to this world. It isn't a choice between chaos and bureaucracy. Those are not the only two choices we have. There is actually a third path out, and it was the one I discovered in those two years. And it's the one I'm going to draw you through, and I believe why you're here why you're here at this conference, to learn about these things. And the word I use for it is structure. Simple, repeatable, measurable, visible structure based on human relationships that feed human energy. You know, there's, an, there's a lot of talk these days about sustainability, of ecosystems, of climate, of energy sources, and so on. I think it's time we start introducing a topic around sustaining the humans who work for us. Because the human energy crisis in our workplace may be the biggest energy crisis we have in the world right now. And that's what I want to explore with you today. And I describe it in the context of joy. And I will tell you, this is a weird word in a business context. To write a business book that has the words joy and love on the cover, I wondered if I'd be taken seriously. Well, given the number of airplane trips I took last year and the number of conferences I keynoted, I was on a plane every week last year. Speaking about joy around the world, clearly the world is hungry for a different kind of business message than the one they've been being fed for quite some time. And for me, this joy is very personal. See, I remember thinking about the title of the book and thinking, why joy? Why would I talk about joy? And people started actually questioning. They said, Rich, where does the joy come from for you? And I, I thought back to that little kid in 1971 and the typing in of those first 
two lines of code and having the computer come back in a roll of paper and clack out high rich because that's what I told it to do. And I thought, yeah, that's where the joy came from. But then I thought about it. I said, no, not really. That's not really where the joy came from for me. I had to go back further. I had to think about myself as a 10-year-old when my parents had bought the equivalent of a, an Ikea bookshelf. They didn't have those back in the United States in those days, but it was the same kind of thing, a piece of furniture and a cardboard box that needed to be assembled. And my parents had gone out to dinner in a movie that night. And 10-year-old me said, you know what? I'm going to build that bookshelf. And I went out in the garage of our house, and I put it all together. It's eight feet wide and six feet tall. It was 50 pieces of wood and 200 little nuts, bolts, and screws. And I was so excited. I couldn't wait. Oh, no. I built it in the garage, and my mom wanted it in the living room. <laughs> so for the next hour, 10-year-old me inched it out of the garage and up the sidewalk and through the kitchen. And I pushed it right into place in the kitchen. And or into the living room, and I set up my dad's books and my mom's little knickknacks in the stereo system, and I had music playing. And when my mom came in the door, she, she was so delighted, she cried. And I realized that's joy. That's why we get into a profession like we do, like in, you know, anything where we're engineering products for the world. What we want more than anything else is to delight other people with the work of our hearts, our hands, and our minds. When you choose engineering as a profession, you are choosing a service-oriented profession. You are building things for others. And you're building it to delight other people. And that's, quite frankly, where the joy comes from for me. And it's clear wherever I go in the world, the heart of the engineer is the same. We want to delight other people. We want people to be amazed with what we've created. And that's what I pursuing inside of our company at Menlo. And there was that time where this was taken away from me, where my joy, that early childhood joy, turned into fear. I learned to be managed with fear, and then I learned to manage with fear. It didn't come naturally for me, but I thought it was just the right thing to do. And I spent a lot of time away from my family. And then I lived in this chaotic world, which, quite frankly, felt like I was coming in every day in a firefighting costume you know, a rubber coat and a plastic helmet and a visor and oxygen on my back, while the processes we were using at my company felt like the metaphorical equivalent of flicking lit cigarette butts everywhere while, while carrying sloshing gas cans. And we wondered why there were fires everywhere. It's because we were setting most of them. And then finally, the saddest story of all in our industry is when the work that we do never sees the light of day. When the boss comes in and says, hey, that thing you've been working on the past two or three years, it got canceled. But don't worry, there's another project coming. Oh, boy, <laughs> how exciting. You see, we want to see our work get out into the world, don't we? We want to see it delivered. We want to see it shipped. And we want people to use it, and we want people to be delighted with it. And when the work gets buried out in the backyard, before it ever sees the light of day, we don't get that chance. You know, there was a company who I believe suffered the largest business project failure in the history of mankind. 10,000 people were assembled for five years in a death march-like culture to produce a product that never saw the light of day. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. It was Windows Vista. As soon as it shipped, Microsoft sent a coupon out with all of the new computers saying, you can downgrade XP, you don't need this operating system. And can you imagine how that felt to the 10,000 engineers at Microsoft? who were working on that, and their work never saw the light of day. It's not what I wanted for me. It's not what I wanted for the people who worked for me. And so I searched, and I found that click moment with Kent Beck's book and the IDEO video, and, and boom, I knew where I was going. And that's what I want to explore with you for the rest of my talk. The question I want to ponder with you is, does joy matter? Can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you touch it? And does it produce business results? Because if it doesn't produce business results, we can't do it for a long time. Because only if we can generate a profit at what we're doing do we get to play another day. Now, I will tell you, a lot of people come to see Menlo. They come from far away. Shane came from New Zealand, <laughs> spent a five days with us. That's not uncommon. People come from all over the planet 
to come see this place in the basement of a parking structure. And when they walk in the door, there's kind of an interesting moment. They're confronted first with a tour count. We keep track of how many people come. This is our tour count last year. Almost 4,000 people came through our doors last year alone just to see what I'm about to describe to you in slides. And when they walk in the door, what they see is one of those horrible open office environments you read about. Fast Company magazine said this is an idea born in the mind of Satan in the deepest caverns of hell. <laughs> and they, they have psychologists with data that proves these environments don't work. Especially for introverted engineers who need library quiet. And whenever those articles come out, and they come out about once a month, everyone sends them to me. And they say, Rich, why does it work at Menlo? And it doesn't seem to work anywhere else. And I tell them it's very simple. You see, we didn't build an open and collaborative workspace. We built an open and collaborative culture. Our workspace is simply a reflection of our cultural values. And that's important because a lot of times, if you come to a conference like this, some, somebody gets an idea and says, yeah, let's do what Menlo's doing. And they just change the physical space, but they don't think about the culture at the same time. That doesn't work. We need to think about all the elements of our culture simultaneously. Workspace is simply one of them. And our space is noisy. <clears throat> we have very few rules at Menlo. One of the strongest is you cannot wear earbuds while you're working. We want people to overhear the ideas of others. We work in one big open room all together. Menlo's kind of about the size of this room. And we work together, shoulder to shoulder, embracing this noise. You can actually see the teamwork. It's not an org chart. It's not a hierarchy. There are, in fact, at Menlo, no bosses. The team works shoulder to shoulder around the tables. They prefer to work this way. They, this environment that they work in is very flexible. We have these pull-down wires from the ceiling and the lightweight aluminum tables. Tell the team, change me if you want to. Change me if you need to. There are no rules around our space. If you want to change the space, you just drag a table over somewhere else. Now, the team will change the space in small ways every single day to adapt to the workflow that we're working on that week. Every once in a while, they get bored with the total setup, and they just come in one night, maybe with a few beers, and they tear the whole place apart and put it back together the next day in a different configuration, and everybody has to figure out where they're sitting. In fact, I sit out in the room with everybody else. There's no corner office for the CEO. The last time I changed the space, they moved me from around this pillar to around this pillar. If they move me that far again, I'll be on the other side of the glass doors. I'm trying to be good these days. I don't choose where I sit. I go where the team puts me. I don't care where I sit. So I figure they'll either put me where I can be the most help or do the least damage. I've learned not to ask that question. The space is also very visual. We use the walls for a lot of our most important artifacts. So you can actually see our process manifesting itself on the wall. And yes, we built that learning organization that I desired when I read Peter Senge's book on the art and practice of learning organizations, the fifth discipline. And we have books everywhere. We have lots and lots of books. But books are just a small piece of the learning system we've created at Menlo. You see, where we built the learning in really is how we organized the team. We connected the team intellectually. We connected them physically and emotionally put them together at one computer. Two people, one computer, working on the same task at the same time all day long. The pairs are assigned, and we switch them every five working days. That construct alone produces so much human energy in the room and so much speed that it defies understanding at times. I'm sure you'll have questions about this part of how we work. We'll have plenty of time for those at the end. And then we realized what we had to do is we had to change the conversation because one of the biggest challenges in the tech industry is we speak a different language than the rest of the world. 
we refer to our language internally at Menlo as dolphin speak. If you've ever heard dolphins make sounds, you know, they seem intelligent. They seem to understand one another, but no one else knows what they're talking about. That's our little tech speak, right? But we realized if we're really going to succeed, we have to learn how to communicate internally inside the team in a different way. We have to learn to communicate differently with the people who are paying us to do the work that we do. And we also need to take care of what I call a lost tribe of technology. And I'll tell you about them later. Now, I love this quote. What's most impressive about this John Nesbitt quote is that he wrote it in 1982. Think about this. He says, the most exciting breakthroughs of where we are today are not going to occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. I was at a deli in Ann Arbor not too long ago, and I was sitting there having a coffee and a bagel, and there was a young couple sitting next to me with their two young children. And it was a Saturday morning when families should be together, and the entire time the parents were sitting there with their two young children, they were like this. And the kids just sat there quietly, and I will tell you, having raised three daughters myself with my wife, all I wanted to do was grab those parents and tell them, you have no idea how fast these years go past. Spend time with your children. Our technology is tending to separate us rather than draw us together. And this is something we need to think about as teams. We think we can solve human relationship issues with technology, and I will tell you, that's the most difficult way to solve it. At Menlo, when we communicate internally with one another inside the room, we don't use electronics. We use what we like to call high-speed voice technology. The hardware was pre-installed at birth. It includes vocal cords, tympanic membranes, auditory nerve stimulation of the brain, supplemented by body language and eyebrows and tonal inflection. In fact, if we want to call an all-company meeting at Menlo, do you guys have meetings where you work? Meetings? Anybody have meetings? Show of hands who has meetings at work. OK, great. We hate meetings. We think they're mind-numbing, spirit-sucking, energy-draining devices of management, so we pretty much eliminate them. And the ones that we do have, we keep them short. So if we want to call an all-company meeting at Menlo, all we do is we say, hey, Menlo, and hey, Rich. So you're going to practice it with me. Hey, Menlo. Hey, Rich. And the whole place goes quiet. Awesome. Now you're in an all-company meeting. You transact the business of the meeting. Nobody moves. No book the conference room. No CC all emails. No checking calendars. Hey, Menlo. Hey, Rich. Boom. Quiet. Do the meeting. Say thank you. Back to work. Our all-company meetings usually last about seven or eight seconds. It's awesome. In fact, if you ever come and visit, you can walk in the front door and say, hey, Menlo. You should say really loud just like our gut yell this morning. And they'll all go, hey, you, because they don't know who you are. And they'll all go quiet, and they'll wait, and they'll be looking at you. <laughs> so you should have something to say. You can just tell them Rich told you to do that, and they'll all laugh and go back to work. We do have one meeting a day. It's our daily stand-up meeting. Our daily stand-up meeting is called by the dartboard on the wall. Why a dartboard has an alarm clock, we have no idea, but it was programmable. We're programmers, so we programmed it to go off at 10. And every day at 10 o'clock, bong, 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 and everyone gathers in a circle. <laughs> yes, we have stand-up meetings of 60 or 70 people all at once. It's crazy. Everybody comes. Even Fern the dog comes to stand up. She knows she's going to get walked after stand-up. And then we pass around the iconic symbol of Menlo, the two-horned plastic Viking helmet. We like the plastic Viking helmet for its practical purpose and value. You see, we work in pairs, so we report out in pairs. This controls the meeting. This is Tracy and Joe talking about some QA work they're doing. Here's Nate and Katie talking about some of the programming work that they're doing. And Thomas and Carol, two of our high-tech anthropologists, we'll talk about that in a minute, talking about the work that they're doing. The token moves around the circle of 70 people and completes. And our stand-ups take 13 minutes. 
It's crazy. How do we know they take 13 minutes? Because we look at the dartboard and usually at the end of the meeting it says 1013. I defy most organizations to begin a meeting of 70 people in 13 minutes, let alone call it, assemble it, start it, hold it, give everyone a chance to report out, complete it, and go back to work in 13 minutes. It's crazy. And then we had to change the conversation with our customers. You see, the problem with software is software is theoretical until you can actually touch it. This is one of the things I appreciate about an iterative and incremental approach to software design and development, is that we now have a chance for the client to check in with us to see how we're doing. And the way we do this when our customer is close is we invite them into the room. They are put front and center. They sit at the keyboard and the mouse while the software is projected on the screen and the team that worked on the software is sitting around them while the customer is going through the software we built the previous five days. Everything at Menlo works in a five-day cycle, and the customer's showing us our work. We don't show it to them. And this draws them right back in, because we realized one of the biggest challenges in software is keeping your sponsor engaged, people who don't know what we know but are paying lots of money for us to do what we do. And we get off track. Software teams always get off track. You know, somebody describes to us what they want done, we go do it, and they come back later, and what do they usually say? Well, is that what you thought we meant? That's not what we meant. Our answer is awesome. We worked on a story card four hours, and less than five days later, we found out we got it wrong. Boom, make mistakes faster. It's not that we prefer making mistakes. We would prefer not to make mistakes. We just know we're going to, we're human. There's going to be, no matter how good a job we do at communication, we're going to make mistakes. So let's make them quickly so we can correct them while they're still small. This actually feeds one of the fundamental elements of our culture to pump fear out of the room. You see, fear has an insidious effect on a team, doesn't it? Fear doesn't make bad news go away. Fear makes bad news go into hiding. And when bad news goes into hiding, we can no longer do anything about it. It's really easy to say we're done in software when we actually aren't done, isn't it? So by putting the customer front and center, they can see exactly what we've done. Sometimes they look and they do that, gee, that's, you, that's what you thought we meant, that's not what we meant at all. Sometimes they look and they say, you know what, what you did is exactly what I was hoping for. It's exactly what I'd imagined. But now that I see it, it's not what I need. Awesome. We worked on a four-hour story card, and less than five days later, we found out we built exactly what you wanted, and now you find out it's not what you need. What do you need? So again, that iterative and incremental approach gives us a chance to actually succeed, because you see, our focus of attention is on joy. And we define the joy in one simple way. We want to see the work of our hearts, our hands, and our minds get out into the world and delight the people we intend to serve the users of the software. And then we do this crazy thing. We go into a paper-based planning system. This is the way we plan. All these little tokens represent estimated story cards. I actually brought some examples here with me. All work at Menlo is first handwritten down on five and a half inch by eight and a half inch index cards. Then the cards are estimated in hours. We don't use t-shirt sizes or story points or gummy bears. We estimate in hours. And then we fold the card to the size of the estimate. So an eight-hour card ends up being half the size of a 16-hour card. Does this make sense? Because if it doesn't, let me show you what a four-hour card looks like. And if you're not getting it, we tape a full-size sheet of paper to a 32-hour card, which makes it twice as big as 16. And then what the customer does is they make decisions around their budget by picking up these little folded sheets of paper and laying them down on a sheet that represents the three fundamental characteristics of professional project management. Time, one week. Humans, two people. Budget, 80 hours worth of effort, two people working together for 40 hours. Yeah, that's a crazy thing about Menlo is we work 40-hour work weeks. We never work weekends. We never deny or delay vacation requests. 
And when you go on vacation, you're not allowed to check your electronics. It's truly a vacation. Why do we do this? Because we want a humanly sustainable pace to our work. Now, I know some of you are here maybe to get some additional training, additional certification. You might even be taking notes right now. So I'm going to teach you our project management system, OK? Now, so get your notebooks out. Here's how it works. This is the add function. Did you see that? That's delete. Add, delete. OK, you've now learned our project management system. I'll leave edit to your own imagination. So what the customer does is, having been trained like I just trained you in our project management system, they start making choices. They start deciding what's in the plan. They work collaboratively alongside of our team. They fill up these sheets and they decide what we should be working on. What are the highest priority things we should be working on? And interestingly, they also decide what we should not be working on. One of the things that confounds most software projects is ambiguity. If, I don't know if this phrase is used here in India, but in the United States, uh, often people who run meetings will say things at the end of a meeting like, we're all on the same page now, right? Have you ever heard that phrase? We're all on the same page? Okay, it translates, good. I'm just never sure culturally whether, uh, so, so you know, somebody says, well, we're all on the same page, right? Ask an annoying question at that meeting. Say, hey boss, I'm okay being on the same page. Which page are we talking about? <laughs> are we talking about the whiteboard, the flip chart, the notebook, the laptop, the email that comes out of the meeting? I'm okay being on the same page, you just gotta tell me which page. But when we say we're all on the same page, we are literally all on the same page. It's not possible to have any, any ambiguity around that. Now the other thing, if you wanna be even more annoying at that same meeting where you said, what page are we on? Say, what did we decide not to do? The boss will look at you kind of funny and say, well, we decided not to do everything we didn't decide to do. Oh, that's clear. Can anybody see in this picture, based on my lengthy description of our project management system, can you see what we've decided not to do? Is it obvious? Somebody just shout out, what did we, wh where do you see what we decided not to do? Yeah, the things that are still up here on the table. Look, at I didn't even have to teach you that part of our system. You could infer it, right? If it's still on the table, it's not in the plan. We're not going to work on it. And here's a fundamental truth of any project management. I don't care if we're going back to the Egypt pyramids. We never have enough time to do everything we imagined. I bet they were planning on building five pyramids in Egypt, and they only built three. Thank goodness the project management system focused on value. Otherwise, we would have had five pyramids 75% complete. And they'd all have a hole in the top. <laughs> They're like, no, let's build three complete pyramids. Awesome, great idea. It's the same thing we're trying to do here with our planning system. Our customers get very invested in this. This is our client looking through these simple handwritten story cards. Now, we love paper. I will tell you, again, I don't know if this translates well, but we have this very simple sect in the United States called the Amish. You guys ever hear about the Amish? They, they don't use electronics. They still ride around in horse-drawn carriages. Uh, some people call us the Amish of software development because we plan with paper. But we love paper. See, even if I just do this, I'm lighting up so many neurons in your brain right now. Because humans are visual, tactile creatures, right? So we choose tools, not because they're not electronic. We choose tools we believe work better for humans, back to that John Naisbitt quote. And we find that humans work really well with these paper-based systems because they're very approachable. They're easy to learn. They're very scalable, amazingly. And it's very collaborative. It's a multi-user system. <clears throat> all supported by simple handwritten artifacts. We, we believe in handwriting because we think it's cognitively impossible to not read something you wrote by hand. Whereas electronics, you do cut and paste and grab attachments and put them together in a document. It may be the case that no one, not even the creator of the document, has read it. Then we put the work plan up on the wall for all to see. It's not tucked away in a server somewhere, it's up on the wall. Every one of these swim lanes represents two people who are assigned to work together for the week. They have their 40 hours worth of work outlined for them. 
They work from top to bottom on each of the story cards. They work on one card till it's done. We don't believe that humans can multitask, so we work on one thing till it's done. You know, in my old life, I used to manage people with percentages. Have you ever been managed like that? Where you're like, you're 25% on this project, you're 50% on this project, you're 10% on this project, you're 15% on this project, you're 35%. Yeah, you know I'm over 100% now, right? Humans can't do that. It's not possible. What does it mean to be 25% in a project? Does it mean, well, let's see, I should work, you know, 12 hours and then this, and then stop and then work on the, or should I like do 15 minutes every hour and then stop and then switch? Or, or should I like be thinking about it while I'm doing other things? Is that what I'm supposed to do? No, in our world, you work on one thing till it's done. The cards are placed next to the day that we expect them to complete based on the estimates that came from the team themselves. This project, every project in our space has a five-day cadence. This particular one starts on Wednesdays and ends on Tuesdays. For one simple reason, the client picks the day they want to check in with us. That's their show-and-tell day. This particular client picked Tuesday, so the project ends on Tuesdays. The yarn indicates where we are in the week, and the color-coded sticky dots give us a sense of status. The sticky dots are important. When a pair starts on a card, they put a yellow dot on the card. That says that's the one we're working on. There should only be one yellow dot in your lane because you only work on one thing until you're done. And when you think you're done, you put an orange dot on the card, you and your pair partner. I emphasize think you're done because programmers have as many different definitions for done as Eskimos have words for snow. You've probably heard many of these different definitions. Maybe you, how many of you have programmed for a living? Coded programmers, yes, like me. You probably use these terms like I did. You'd say things like, well, it, you know, it's done, but it's not done, done. Well, it's finished, but it's not ready. Well, it's ready, but it's not complete. Well, it's complete, but it's not installable. Well, it's installable, but it's not deployable, right? You see where I'm going with this, right? So our programmers can only self-declare they think they're done. And then QA, our quality advocates, come around, check your work, and if QA likes what you see, you get a green dot. It's an endorphin rush for the programmers. If QA doesn't like what you see, you get a red dot. That's endorphin rush for the QA team. <laughs> Any QA people in the room? Oh, excellent. You're going to love this. Okay, this is my favorite moment this talk. QA people, when, when you're checking stuff, okay, I need to like make eye contact with at least a couple of you, so raise your hands again. QA people, excellent, great. So you're checking stuff, right, and you, you find something wrong every now and then, right? You're, you're going through, and you're like, oh, this didn't work the way it's supposed to. And you, you kind of walk down the hall or whatever to the programmers, and you're like, call them on the phone, say, hey, um, this thing isn't working right. What's the most likely thing a QA person is to hear from the programmer? Yeah, it, it worked on my machine, right? <laughs> it's another definition of done. It worked on my machine. Now, QA people, if you learn nothing else in this conference from any other speaker, take this one home with you. As soon as you hear a programmer say it worked on my machine, grab their machine and ship it to the customer. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing how much of a cheer that gets. <laughs> it's like, what's the point the programmer's trying to make, right? It worked on my machine, so what, right? Can we get it to work on at least one other computer on planet Earth? That would be really cool, right? Now, if you grab their machine and ship it, they can never say it worked on my machine again because they don't have their machine anymore. <laughs> And I want to channel the heart of the QA people, because I'm telling you, I think QA people get a lot of grief. Because people are like, what kind of person would delight in breaking things? Like, what kind of personality is that? Well, let me tell you what kind of personality it is. QA wants to break it while it's still in the room. QA takes it personally when broken software gets out into the world. You want that mentality on your team. So let's give it up for the QA people just for a second here. <clears throat> now I want to talk about the Lost Tribe. You know, I, if you think about Lost Tribes, I, I think about like the 
Amazon forest. You know, the anthropologists are hacking through the jungle, and one day they come across this tribe no one has ever seen before. There's never been any contact with humanity before this other, you know, the tribe with itself, of course. But the anthropologists are like, oh my gosh, we've never seen you before. In the technology industry, we call them the users. <laughs> no, let me be more accurate. We call them stupid users, don't we? Right? Now, and then we write dummies books for those poor people, right? What? other industry can get away with, through their entire history, calling the people they serve stupid. Oh, you know, they're just stupid users, right? Um, so what we need to do is change that mentality. These are the people we serve. We need to think about how to delight them with the work that we do. At Menlo, what we did was we injected something completely new into the system. We have a set of people on our team who are called high-tech anthropologists. Their job, go out into the world and study people in their native environment. Observe them. Not ask them questions, not interrogate them, not send them survey forms, not do focus groups, actually observe them doing work in their native environment. And with empathy and compassion, bring back the knowledge they've gained through this process and turn it into screen designs that will actually be understandable by the people who are going to use the software. See, it's amazing to me how used to things we've gotten in the technology industry. Let's face it, we're the industry that gives you, if you want to shut down your computer, please press the start button. That's intuitive, right? Or if that's too hard, control alt delete is even easier, right? Like, we've gotten used to this stuff, right? If people don't understand this, they don't, we call them stupid. We don't want to do that. Now, our anthropologists have their own set of paper-based tools. Who knew that if you wanted to do user-centered design, you might put a story about one of your most typical users in the center of a design artifact? It's pretty simple. This is a device we call a persona map. What we do is we go out in the world and we discover there's different types of people out in the world that are going to use a software we're building, so we define them in these little archetypal forms of personas. And then we have our client prioritize these personas, but because I will tell you this, if you build a piece of software that you want to work for everyone, it will work for no one in particular. <clears throat> so what we do is prioritize the different types of users in this persona mapping exercise. We force our customer to pick a primary persona and that's the person we're going to primarily serve. Every design decision is then filtered through this device. If we're going to add a feature in, if the name of the primary persona is Gary in this case, we will say, how will this feature work for Gary? And people say, well, it's not for Gary, it's for one of the secondary personas or the tertiary personas. We say, okay, so we're going to make it work for Bill rather than for Gary. How do we add it in for Bill in a way that doesn't interfere with Gary's work? Because Gary's primary. Now, I'll just give you a simple example of how this works because it's amazing what you can discover when you go out in the world. This is really important to go out in the world and watch people in their native environment because you will learn things through observation you won't normally learn other ways. We were working on a handheld touchscreen tool for diesel motor mechanics, people who fix trucks. The first observation we did was at the Ann Arbor Transit Authority where they fix buses for the city that we live in. And the first thing Bubba did that was working on a bus is he put on a pair of rubber gloves to do his work. Our anthropologists didn't even realize that the capacitive screen that was picked for the hardware would, wouldn't work with rubber gloves. They brought that information back to our technical team, and our technical team said, well, he's going to have to take off his gloves whenever he uses the device. And our anthropologist said, you've never met this guy. He's not going to take off his gloves. In fact, he'll sabotage the device before he takes off his gloves. You'll slow him down. So we called up our customer, had been in this domain for 30 years, and we said, hey guys, do you know your users wear rubber gloves when they work? There was silence on the other end. They'd been in this industry for 30 years. And they said, they do? And one of their engineers said, man, you guys are so lucky. We said, why is that? He said, you get to talk to our end users. He says, I've been here 12 years. I've never even met one of our end users. Remember the hacking through the job? Oh, look. 
you're here. Go out into the world and study the people you intend to serve. Our anthropologists bring this information back. They synthesize it because it starts out, it feels very ambiguous at the beginning. So they have to bring this information back and synthesize it and then eventually boil it down into pixel-perfect screen designs that our software developers then turn into working software. It's a very different kind of role in our team. Now I want to leave you with an idea because I know how these conferences work. I've been to lots of them. You're going to get ideas today. You might have gotten some from me. You might get some from the other speakers. But you're here to learn something. And you're here to get excited. You're here maybe to bring something back to the office with you. But I know how those conversations go. Because your colleagues aren't here. There's people back at your workplaces who didn't come with you. And you get some idea. You run back to the office the next day. And you grab the first person you meet who wasn't here and says, I've got this idea. And you tell them what you, what you learned here. And that person looks at you in the eye and says, oh, that won't work. That's not us. HR won't allow that. And right then, the idea dies, doesn't it? And you just go off. You've got emails to check. You've got meetings to go to. You just go and do this. OK, I want to arm you with one simple response. When somebody looks you in the eye, with your idea and says, that won't work. You just look them in the eye and say, yeah, I know. Let's run the experiment. Let's try something before we defeat it. Let's see what happens. Let me tell you a story of how this played out in our world at Menlo. Now, this is a story about dogs and babies, OK? But if that's all you remember, you will have missed that earlier point. Because this is really a story about let's run the experiment. It's just a fun story, a fun application of it that has to do with dogs and babies. So nine years ago, one of our team members, one of our revered team members, Tracy, had little Maggie. She was off on maternity leave, and she was ready to come back to work. She came to me, and she said, Rich, I'm ready to come back to work. I said, awesome. We can't wait to have you back. How soon can you be here? And she said, well, there's just one small problem. The daycare we plan to put Maggie in is full. Grandparents live too far away to help. My husband and I don't know what to do with the baby. Now, I will tell you, in this moment, there was a screaming match that occurred in my, my head that Tracy never heard. You know how these go. There's the dark voice on one shoulder and the bright voice on the other one. The dark voice said, don't you dare say what you're about to say. HR will kill you. The lawyers will freak out. The insurance policy will go through the roof. The bright voice said, it's your company. You're an entrepreneur. You can do whatever you want. You don't even have an HR department. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at Tracy. I said, bring her in. Now, if I'd only had a camera in that moment to catch the look of bewilderment on her face, she says, what do you mean? I said, bring her into work. She said, all day? I said, sure. She said, every day? <laughs> I said, why not? And she looked around that big open room. And she said, Rich, where will I put her? I said, Tracy, she's not going anywhere. She's three months old. I said, put her in a bassinet on the floor wherever you're working. Put her in a pack and play. Put her in a stroller, whatever. Put her in a car seat. She said, Rich, what if she makes a fuss? I said, here it's like a noisy restaurant. You'll never hear her. She goes, come on, Rich. There will be those moments. You've raised daughters. You know what it's like. There's going to be a big baby fuss. It'll disturb the whole room. And I said, Tracy, you're the mom. I trust you. You'll do the right thing. Let's work it out together. Let's run the experiment. Now, isn't she beautiful? Funny thing is, that's not Ellie. No, that's not Maggie. That's Ellie. That's, that's Menlo baby number eight. Oliver, I left, when I left the office to come here, Oliver was there. Menlo, Oliver is Menlo baby number 13 in the last nine years. This experiment has been a beautiful part of our culture. The babies come in all day, every day, for months at a time. There is often, usually, a baby in the room with us because... I don't know, we're a prolific crowd at Menlo or something. We, 
we think we know what's causing this now. Uh, <clears throat> now, I have to tell you, when you run experiments, this is important, expect the unexpected. And when you bring a baby into a room, unexpected things happen. Now, the things that we expected to happen, of course they did. Did Maggie fuss? Of course she did. She was a baby. What we didn't expect was the response of the team. The team was like, no, it's my turn to hold the baby. And they're just grabbing the baby and they're carrying. These babies were raised by the village, right? I lead a lot of the tours. They would just, oh, Rich, you're leading a tour? Nice warm chest, deep voice. It's nap time. You can put a baby to sleep as good as anybody. So they just handed me the baby, and I'd be carrying a baby around on tours, right? And then we found out that Ellie learned, wanted to pair program. <laughs> Ellie wanted to go to design meetings. <laughs> This was a delightful addition to your culture. Henry came back to visit. Visited Tracy, Menlo mom number one. Tracy, uh, Henry is Menlo baby number seven. Fern wanted to get in on the conversation, the dog. And then we discovered something really delightful. We found out that our customers behave better when you bring a baby to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> They were like, you guys are awesome. <laughs> and we're like, oh my gosh, they're part of the marketing team. It's cool. <laughs> <Right>. <clears throat> you cannot de deny the joy of a baby at work. This is little Henry with, uh, with John, his dad. You know, I told the parents, I said, look, if we have a chance to let you guys see the, one of those baby firsts, you know, the first rollover, the first word, the first step, the first crawl, whatever, and you can see that at work, awesome. It's just been a delightful way to build our team and our culture. This is Henry learning to manage. Hey, how's it going? What you working on? Are you almost done? You staying this weekend? <laughs> and then this happened. Um, we've always had dogs in our office, um, and, uh, but this was a little different situation. See, Michael here was our customer. He's coming in for a show and tell, and he called me ahead of time, and he says, hey, Rich, do you mind if I bring Buster with me to the meeting? And I said, sure, who's Buster? He says, my great Dane. I'm like, oh, sure. And he comes in with this dog that's like almost horse size, right? <laughs> and Buster greeted me, because he's a really friendly creature, and he put his paws on my shoulders, and his head was here. And it, if you've been with me, you know I'm a tall guy, right? And I'm like looking up at this dog. It's a little unnerving, OK? But so. And it was a fun story. Buster loved to hang out at the office. Um, he would take our glass doors and he'd just pull them apart so he could stick his nose out into the smells of Menlo, I guess. And um, I realized that this story was fun for the dog, but it was actually far more important. What I realized was our customer was choosing to be like us. Our customer was choosing to participate in our culture. And I think about the trust that we work on so hard inside the team and we try and build trust also with our customer. When you have your customers starting to behave like you, you realize you've built a special culture indeed. And I would encourage you to think about that as you think about the type of cultures you're creating inside of your organizations. See, Michael wanted to be like us. Michael couldn't bring his dog in where he worked. It wasn't that he was in a bad office situation. It just wouldn't be appropriate given what he does for a living. But when he chose to interact with us, he brought his dog in. We've actually had customers bring their children to work with, to, to Menlo with them. And then, mind-blowingly, uh, little Lucy was uh, Menlo baby number 12. John, um, who had Henry there, this was his second child, the customer knew that Lucy was in the office. The customer called up and said, hey, John, uh, we need you to come over to our office. They were right in Ann Arbor, just a few blocks away can you come to the meeting? And they said, but John, do you have Lucy with you? And he says, well, yeah, but that's okay. I can leave her here for some team members. It'll be all right. And they said, oh, no, we want you to bring Lucy, too. So there's John walking across Ann Arbor with a stroller going to a business meeting. <laughs> I can't even imagine this stuff is actually occurring. So again, just think about how do we build such an engaging environment that the people we work with and around and collaborate with 
want to be more like us. They want to join your tribe. And there's no question inside of all of this that while we have fun at Menlo, <clears throat> I want to be very clear, joy and happiness are two very different things. We are not happy every minute of every day. It's not possible. That would require medication. <laughs> but joy is that longer arc. Joy is that all that hard work we did together gets out into the world and delights the people for whom it's intended. And there's no way you can get to that kind of joy without the rigor and discipline of many of the methods that you might be talking about at a conference like this. For us, we've had a team together now for 15 years. One of the strongest parts of our culture is the use of automated unit testing frameworks. Test-driven design, write the test before you write the code, automate the tests and run them. Probably one of the most powerful tools to ever occur in, my, in the history of my career. And it's amazing how few teams use it. They don't teach it at universities yet systematically. It's probably the most important quality tool that we've ever invented in our industry and it's still ignored to this day. So don't forget that at the end of the day, we can delight people with a great user experience, but there has to be solid working software under the surface or that delight of the user experience will quickly erode under the crashing of broken software. What I wanted to do in those early days to get out of the chaos and the bureaucracy was to build a learning organization. And as Peter Senge says, it is the only sustainable source of competitive advantage is your company's ability to learn faster than your competition. That's what we wanted to do. It's been an amazing journey for me. I'm glad to have come all the way to India to share it with you. I would love to get your feedback. There's a landing page we've created specially for you. There's places you can download these slides, get a free chapter of the book, that sort of thing. There's also a place for feedback form. I am happy to take questions now. Thank you very much for bringing me into your world. So attrition? Yeah. So, whoa, interesting. Um, so I'll repeat the question if you don't get there quick enough with the mic so we can work together on this. So the question is, what kind of attrition do we have in our team? And I think our attrition is pretty standard. We don't unnaturally work to hold on to people too long. If they want to go, we embrace them on leaving. Uh, but interestingly, it's hard for us to measure attrition because people leave and they come back. And often when they come back, they plead with me and they say, please don't ever let me leave again. <laughs> But, you know, people leave for all the standard reasons. They, uh, we had three people leave a couple of years ago because they wanted to go live in Manhattan, one of the big cities in, in, uh, in the United States. And I didn't want to deny them that pleasure. And they all went together because they went as a small group and, uh, and they're just having a delightful time there. And who am I to deny them that kind of uh, uh, experience? But, um, you know, when you build things in like bring your babies to work, you do get a lot of loyalty as well. So I think... Uh, uh, we don't have to work unnaturally to hold on to people, which I think is one of the biggest uh, things about a strong culture is. Because the trouble is we start to hold on to people unnaturally if we, if we work really hard to keep them when they don't really want to be here. I'm not sure you want those people walking in the door every day because they've got maybe a different mindset than you were hoping for. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>